a perfect segue to start talking about trusts. And um, as you mentioned, I think there is sort of a misconception about trust that they're only for the wealthy and, and possibly, which I'm gonna ask you is what's the history on trust. But of course we all know about trust fund babies. And of course those are associated with the super wealthy, but please, if you can give us some of the layman's history about trusts and how, you know, perhaps those super wealthy did create these, but they've been able to keep their families out of court and anybody else can also work within those same parameters because the laws affect all of us. So to kind of understand trust, you got you to gotta break it down to its bare bones. What is a trust, but simply a contract? It's a three-way contract that you create between you as the grantor, the person giving or donating the asset, a home, money, bank accounts, what have you, in trust to a trustee, that's the second person in this contract, the person in charge, the person holding on to that asset, holding on to that money on behalf of someone else, your beneficiary, the third person. So you have a grantor, or as we call a settler, someone settling the trust, you have a trustee, and then you have a beneficiary. Now, originally, trusts were used in business when a lot of business partners or business entities, they wanted to come together, but they didn't want to form a partnership, but they had some kind of central controlling asset that they wanted to put in a trust to make sure neither partner takes advantage of each other. So they, they create some kind of third party person. Other examples, this is, this is not exactly a trust as we know today, but like escrow is a, is a kind of a form of a trust where uh, when you're buying a home, you use a title agency as the escrow agent. The title agency is the man in the middle, right? Holding on to the money, holding on to the deed of title to make sure that your sales contract uh, closes on time and that everyone does everything they need to do on time so that at the end of close, if the everything's ready to go, then escrow closes. Same with the trust. A trust you create generally for your life, right? So during your life, you might create a foundational trust called a revocable living trust. What is this? This is uh, basically a contract that you create between yourself and whoever you name as trustees, which can also be yourself. And then from there, if something happens to you, your trustee will take control or whoever you name as successors. And then if once you pass away, your trustees will take control again, and they will pass your assets on to your beneficiaries in the way that you want, however you want. Think of it as like a blank canvas. You can write, I want this money held until my son goes to school, right? A very common notion of what people do. The same thing that you put in a will, but this time you can use a trust to do that. So now trusts have evolved much more over time. We started seeing them in estate planning with the well-off when the rich and famous could hire lawyers who could do tons and tons of research, look into case law without the internet, you guys. Think about that, right? That's a lot of work. And that's why it was so expensive to create these trusts. People were paying a lot of money. So you had someone like J.D. Rockefeller at the time that he owned Standard Oil. He had a massive amount of money, probably in today's standards, huge, still extreme, probably could be more than Bezos in theory, right? Um, I don't have the numbers exactly, but it's still a pretty stellar, a phenomenal amount of money for the time that he was living in. And he moved his ownership of the company in a trust, right? For two reasons. One, privacy. Trusts are private documents. They're not like wills, which are public documents. So anything that happens to JD, right? It will be passed down in a trust and nobody will know how that works except for his beneficiaries and his trustees, of course, right? Another reason he did that was for what we like to call asset protection. And not every estate planning attorney is actually educated in this area, at least not in the past. They are, they are getting better because there's a lot more training. There's a lot more information out there. Um, so attorneys are learning a lot faster because of the internet and how fast we can get case law at our fingertips on how to evolve and adapt. But what I mean by asset protection was when you put assets, anything in a trust, you are no longer the owner. So if I put my home in a trust, I'm no longer the owner of that home. My trustee or my trust is the owner of the home. So that one maneuver there removes me from ownership. So in the past, that means if you don't own it, you can't get sued for it, right? 
Um, and that's exactly what was happening historically in the past. Uh, uh, well, to, well to do people were putting their business interests, their large uh, sums of wealth into a trust. And because they no longer own it, if they ever got sued, when the creditor or the judgment creditor was coming after them, they say, well, you can't touch my standard oil stock because I don't own it. So you can only touch whatever I own, right? I'm personally liable to you for whatever I own. So I can't be personal li personally liable for something I don't own. So that's how that worked in the past. Today, courts are a little bit smarter and they're like, no, no, no. You can't just hide your wealth in a trust. We can come after it, right? But there are lawyers, as, as you know, it's always a tug of war between courts and lawyers. So we've been bending the rules based on the laws that our government creates saying, all right, maybe we don't own it, but what if we don't control it either? What if I'm not the trustee, right? What if someone else is the trustee? Can I then have full protection from the wealth or the assets I put into this trust from any of my own creditors? Potentially, potentially, not in every state now. Uh, every state's kind of built carving out their own laws on how they want trust in. You know what that means? Whenever there's more complications, there's more opportunities. And so we see trust evolving in two ways. The first way is families are using trust plain and simply to avoid probate. They want to keep their loved ones out of court, out of conflict. So they're creating these foundational estate plans, the revocable living trust to move their assets into it so that if something happens to them during life, remember a trust will take care of you during life. A will only takes care of you during death, right? So if you have a will, you're, you're doing death planning. You're not doing life planning. You're going to need like a will. And some attorneys will say a power of attorney to go with that because a power of attorney allows someone else to take care of you while you're alive. A will allows someone else to take care of your affairs after you've died, right? A trust can do both. Trust is legal life planning. So if you become incapacitated or if you all of a sudden uh, can't, you, you grow so old to the point where you can't write your own checks if we have checks at that point, right? <laughs> or, but you can't, you can't get out of the house to go grocery shopping. You need someone who can do that stuff for you. Maybe that will be a caregiver. Maybe that will be your trustee. Uh, maybe it will be a trustee hiring a caregiver. But the point is, is the moment you become unable to take care of yourself, your trust and the people you've put in charge can take over your financial life to be able to handle things for you without court involvement. I can't tell you enough how huge that is. And if you want a clear cut example of an estate plan gone bad or a situation gone bad where it would have been nicer if somebody had a trust, go look at Britney Spears. Okay. Britney Spears has over a hundred million dollars. She is a young girl. She's still doing co a concert. She's a young woman, excuse me. She's still doing concerts. She's still performing, producing content and intellectual property for herself, a thriving, growing business. And yet she owns none of it. She controls none of it. Her conservators, her dad and his lawyers control and are running this. Britney has been under a conservatorship for over I think it's been 10 years now, right? I don't remember exactly the amount of time, but what had happened is she, she essentially had a mental breakdown. The whole world saw it when she shaved her head. And from that moment, her father, this, and it, it could have been anybody, but it was her father who went to a judge and said, oh my gosh, my daughter is having problems. We get that. She has mental health issues and she cannot control her affairs and she's about to lose her entire business. So I wanna take over. Judge, appoint me to be the conservator over Brittany so I can have full control over her life. Two things happen there. First, now Brittany and her affairs are public because it's all in court and the court sealed some of those documents. So we don't know exactly how father got appointed or what the judge saw. There's, there's a lot of details we don't know. And if it, it, so it's hard to say whether that was the right move or not. And in, in my opinion, I don't think it was the wrong move at the time. But now, here we are 10 years later, father is still in control. Brittany still doesn't have control of her life. And there's theories that uh, some of that control is being used to prevent her from seeing her own children. You know, she has to be a good girl. Otherwise, she doesn't get to see her kids. That, when, when you have a conservator on your life, they have control over your money, how you can earn money, when and where you pay, can spend your money. 
And you, if you get creative, think about how you can manipulate someone's life when it comes to money. All right. This is how parents manipulate their children.